welcome to the Prince Street Church Podcast, where God's Word speaks to everyday life. This morning we are returning to our summer-long survey of the book of 2 Samuel, the story of David's reign as king over Israel. So far, we have seen David at his best, using the power that God had entrusted to him to, to do God's will and to bless people's lives. We've also seen David at his worst, using the power that God had entrusted to him to pursue his own will and destroy people's lives. When we pressed pause on this storyline a couple of weeks ago, we saw Nathan, the prophet, confronting David on his sin. As a result, David repents of his sin. Not, goes, goes beyond just saying, I'm sorry. Goes beyond confession to genuine repentance. Uh, a repentance that you rarely see, even in the pages of the Bible. And as a result of David's genuine repentance, God takes away David's sin. Literally transferring the debt of David's sin from his balance sheet onto Jesus' balance sheet. So David will not pay the death penalty because Jesus is going to pay the death penalty. David will live, but the consequences of his sin will continue. For forgiveness cancels sin's debt, not the consequences. And as we pick up the story today, there is trouble brewing in David's household. And it's about to erupt. So grab your Bible and your note sheets, please, and join me at 2 Samuel chapter 13. Now, as you get there, I want to remind you that on the back side of your note sheet, you have your reading plan. I know many of you are following this reading plan so that you're not only hearing my sermons on Sunday morning, but you are reading through the entire book of 2 Samuel during this series. That, uh, that is there for you. I also want you to know that if you've had to miss one of the previous episodes, or if you'd just like to share what you're learning with some friends... This entire series is available for you online, either at our website at princestreetchurch.com or on our YouTube channel, or if you prefer an audio podcast, that's available on our iTunes feed as well. Feel free to use those resources, however they're going to help you best. Well, there's no question that David is a great king. He's a man after God's own heart. His sin concerning Bathsheba and Uriah was the exception to the rule, but it was a grievous exception. And in order for today's passage, and the passage we'll look at again next week, in order for them to make sense, we've got to roll back the clock a little bit to take a look at the indictment that Nathan pronounces on David when confronting him on his sin. This sets the stage for everything that's going to come next. Here is 2 Samuel chapter 12, 10 to 12. It's on the screens for you. The sword will never depart your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Now, if you recall, this indictment was pronounced before David's repentance and forgiveness. And although David has been forgiven of his sin, the consequences of his sin that Nathan tells him are going to take place, those things begin immediately. David's son, which he conceived in sin, dies on the seventh day of his life. A pain that I can't even begin to wrap my brain around. But it's only the beginning of the consequences that David is going to experience. 
As chapter 13 opens, we are introduced to three more of David's children. Two sons, Amnon and Absalom, and a daughter named Tamar. Now, Tamar is Absalom's full sister and Amnon's half-sister. Remember, David has multiple wives, so the, the math works out. We're told that, Dame, that Tamar is absolutely gorgeous. We're also told, as you read through the text, that Tamar is a good, godly woman. Amnon, however, is a complete pagan. Amnon we're told, loves Tamar in a way that a brother should not desire his sister. He's determined to have her. And so he pretends to be sick and asks his father to send Tamar to take care of him. When she does, Tamar, Amnon invites Tamar to bed. She resists, saying, brother, don't, don't do this thing. But Amnon is determined. He overpowers Tamar. He rapes her. And then sends her away. Once again, Tamar pleads with her brothers, please, at least marry me so that I have some kind of future. But Amnon's not interested in marriage. He's already gotten everything he wants from Tamar. So he sends her away in disgrace. Tamar is devastated. She has done nothing but serve God and her family faithfully. And because of her brother's sin, she is left without a family and without a future. Well, certainly her family will take up for her. Let's see how they respond. We're down at chapter 13, verse 20 and following. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. When King David heard all this, he was furious. Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister. So when David hears what happens, he's angry, but he does nothing. The anger is understandable, but doing nothing? How is it possible that David does nothing? Nothing. How can he allow Amnon to get away with this horror? I know it strikes our modern ears as odd, but just because, Tam just because Amnon does not want to take Tamar as his wife does not keep a wedding from happening. The law makes it clear. And if David had simply pressed charges... Amnon would have had no choice. The law would have required him to receive Tamar as his wife and provide for her for the rest of her life. But David doesn't do that. Why not? The answer is in the previous verse. You see, Absalom has a very different outcome in mind. He just needed to wait for the right timing and the right opportunity. He tells his sister to keep quiet. Don't say anything. Let's keep this inside the family. We'll take care of it here. His decision to... to hit that, that order seals Tamar's fate. She has no hope of marriage. No hope of children, no hope of a family, no hope of a future. But it also ties David's hands. 
No matter how much David may have wanted to press charges, without Tamar's testimony, all he has is an unsubstantiated rumor. For two years, talk about consequences. For two years, David lives knowing what his sons have done and not being able to do anything about it. And then things get worse. Absalom's day of revenge has finally come. He deceives David into allowing Amnon and the rest of his brothers to come to Absalom's home for a cookout. As typical in these events, wine is flowing freely and Amnon becomes drunk. When he becomes drunk, Absalom's henchmen fulfill their orders. They murder Amnon in cold blood leaving the rest of the brothers running for their lives. The initial report that comes back to David is that Absalom has killed all of his brothers. But Jonadab, one of David's nephews, clears up what has taken place. Look at 2 Samuel 13, verse 32. But Jonadab, son of Shemaiah, David's brother, said, My lord should not think that they killed all the princes... Only Amnon is dead. This has been Absalom's expressed intention ever since the day Amnon raped his sister Tamar. This has been Absalom's expressed intention. Those words had to cut through David like a knife. In allowing himself to be deceived by Absalom, David is now an unwitting accomplice in his own son's murder. Absalom runs for the hills, seeking sanctuary with his grandpa. And for three more years, David lives under the burden and with the consequences of everything that has gone down. Well, as chapter 14 opens, we see David longing to be reunited with his son, Absalom. Yes, Absalom has done terrible things, but he's still David's boy. And David loves his son. Knowing this, knowing how it's weighing on David, Joab, the commander of David's armies, also another nephew, Joab devises this scheme in order to, to bring some level of reconciliation to this broken family. His strategy is to imitate Nathan, to send someone to David to tell a story that sounds plausible and is exactly like David's own situation. We'll send somebody, turns out to be the woman from Tekoa, who is not exactly the woman from Ipanema. Nevertheless, just seeing how many of you are sleeping. Um, (laughs) Joab sends this woman from Tekoa, that's all we know about her, to tell this story that that is sort of like David's situation with Absalom, and she's hoping to to deceive David into passing judgment on this story and then applying that judgment to his own situation. The only problem is, this time, David is not the one who has sinned, and God is not the one who has sent this story. And so it's really, really awkward. You see, David's not, David has not sinned. It is not sinful for David to be loving his son. Nor is it sinful for David to long to be reunited with his son. But it would be unjust for David to pardon Absalom. He doesn't have that authority. Only God can handle that. It wouldn't even be just for David to be the one to pursue Absalom. 
So this woman from Tekoa comes into the court and tells this really awkward story. And as you read through the text, you'll see banter back and forth. It's clear that pretty much right from the start, David smells a rat. But at the end of the day, Joab succeeds. He allows Absalom to return from exile to Jerusalem with one caveat. Glance down there at verse 24, chapter 14, verse 24. But the king said, he must go to his own house. He must not see my face. So Absalom went to his own house and did not see the king. Now, considering the circumstances, considering the fact that Absalom is a murderer, he's got a pretty good deal going. He can come and go as he pleases from his home, and he does. He can start a family, which he does. He can become the envy of Israel, which he does. He just can't interact with the court. He can't see David's face. Well, Absalom, in fact, does become the envy of Jerusalem. He begins a family, three sons and a daughter, the daughter named Tamar. But that's not enough for Absalom. Absalom wants more. He becomes frustrated. He becomes angry at these consequences that he's experiencing. Absalom wants to be fully restored without consequences. And so he demands to see the king. And look what he tells Joab. 2 Samuel 14, verse 32. Absalom said to Joab, Look, I sent word to you and said, Come here so I can send you to the king and ask, Why have I come from Geshur? It would be better for me if I was still there. Now then, I want to see the king's face. And if I am guilty of anything... Let him put me to death. Wow! I mean, how do those thoughts even enter Absalom's mind? Much less the words come out of his mouth. Does he really believe he's without guilt? Apparently so. And the only way he can see himself without guilt is if he's decided that God's law doesn't matter. Well, it matters as long as it doesn't impact my life. Absalom was more than happy to enforce the death penalty on Amnon for a crime that did not call for the death penalty, just a marriage. And yet when it comes to his own case, where the death penalty is demanded, Absalom apparently believes he should get off scot-free. And amazingly, his power play works. David allows Absalom to come to the court, receives him with an embrace and with a kiss. And as chapter 14 comes to an end, David has regained his son. Absalom has regained his father. But those consequences that Nathan pronounced in that indictment, believe it or not, they have yet to play themselves all the way out. We'll just need to keep those for another day. Instead, I'd like to spend a little time just talking about how this story from so long ago impacts us. You know, this isn't just a story about people who lived a long time ago who are very different than us. No, no. These people may have lived a long time ago, but they are very much like us. And this episode from David's life reminds us of a truth that many of us would prefer to avoid. That is that forgiveness cancels sin's debt, not its consequences. David was forgiven. His debt was paid. But the consequences of his sin lasted the rest of his life. 
and led him down a journey of suffering that many of us couldn't even imagine walking. Now here's where many of us get tripped up. We connect forgiveness with the removal of consequences, don't we? You know, when we ask to be forgiven from something, we not only want to be forgiven of the penalty of the violation, we also want to be freed from any consequences as the result of our decision. In fact, many of us are much more focused on getting out of the consequences than we are in dealing with the problem that caused the consequences. And so we take the role of Absalom. Getting angry and frustrated by our consequences. Demanding reconciliation with no consequence. But my friends, it doesn't work that way. Forgiveness? Forgiveness cancels sin's debt. But not its consequences. Jesus paid the debt for our sin. We were all dead folk walking. We all deserve death. For the wages of sin is death. That's what we all deserve. But when we come before God in genuine repentance, God took that debt from us, put it on Jesus' account. He died on the cross paying our debt. Thanks be to God. He paid the debt we could never pay. But the consequences, the consequences of our sin remain. Often, the, often consequences we end up living with and dealing with for the rest of our lives. And it's how we respond to those consequences that determine whether the consequences will push us into God's arms or drive us away from God's presence. You see, God is not some angry cosmic parent simply looking to punish us for the things that we've done. He's not some angry deity watching us to see when we slip so he can whack us in the back of the head. That's not who God is. God is a loving parent. And yes, he allows us to experience consequences, but not as punishment, as discipline. And there's a huge difference between those two things. David experienced massive suffering as a consequence of his sin. But as you read through the Bible, you will find instance after instance after instance of God's people suffering even though they've done nothing wrong. You'll find God's people suffering simply because they are God's people. So the purpose of the suffering we experience, whether it's the consequences of our sin or not, the purpose there is not punishment. It's discipline. It's intended to cause us to run into God's arms. Yes, David's suffering was severe. And I'm not saying that his suffering wasn't connected to its, his sin. I'm simply pointing out that David's consequences were not the punishment for his sin. Forgiveness cancels the debt, just not the consequences. Now before I close, there is one more thing I want to touch on from this story. And that is to point out that Amnon and Absalom's sin was the result of their own choices. I know it's popular to blame all our problems on somebody else today. So 
so I want to point this out. Amnon and Absalom's sin was the fruit of their own choices. Yes, every parent should strive as much as possible to be the best parent they can be, but there's no such thing as a perfect parent, not even Janet. And even if there were perfect parents, the fact of the matter is that godly parents do not guarantee godly children. Yes, I know, Proverbs talks about how uh, train a child up in the way he should go, and then in, when he gets old, he won't depart from it. Remember, Proverbs are truisms. They are things that are generally true in most situations, not guarantees. Godly parenting does not guarantee godly children. Look at the Bible. Some of the go most godly men and women of the Bible ended up having children that made Grievously sinful choices. So when your children fail, and they will, remember, it's not appropriate for us as parents to take the blame and the guilt of our children's sin onto our own shoulders as though it's our own fault. Yes, David, David's failures negatively impacted his sons and his children's lives. Yes, that's clear. Having said that, I don't believe anywhere in the passage you'll see a description of David being a bad father. Solomon turned out okay, didn't he? Amnon and Absalom's sin was the result of their own choices. And look how God used even the consequences of that in David's life. God was able to take the consequences of his, his children's sinful choices and use it to drive David back into relationship with God. Back into alignment with God's will. To make David even more a man after God's own heart. So if you're here this morning and you find yourself overcome by guilt because one or more of your children have walked away from God, please don't leave this place this morning owning the guilt for their sin. It's not yours to own. It may not be yours at all. So by all means, pray for your children. Pray that God would draw them back into relationship with himself. But even if they continue to rebel, know that God is able to use even that pain, that suffering, to cause you to run into his arms, to mold you and shape you and make you even more a person after God's own heart. That's what he did for David. And if he did it for David, he'll do it for you as well. Brothers and sisters, what is God saying to you today? What's he whispering in your ear? What's he calling you to do as a result of of what he has said to you. On the back of your note sheet, there's a space for you to answer a couple of questions and, and take a couple of notes. As our musicians come to the stage to lead us in a final song, I invite you to consider what God's saying to you and what he's calling you to do as a result of it. Go ahead.